Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Calgary Flames are entering their 40th season, and here we are back again with Fireside Chat entering our 8th. As always, I'm Dan Stevenson alongside Matt DeBorg, and Matt, here we go for another hockey season. Oh, I'm looking forward to seeing the Flames in their new retro jerseys for the Heritage Classic in Saskatchewan later this season, and looking forward to some Flames hockey. Well, let's start there. The Flames unveiled yesterday at the time we record this um, their retro jerseys, and it is, as we all expected, the I guess the best summation is a modern version of the 80s white jersey, which a lot of fans forget was the home jersey at the time. Um do you, I've seen a lot of fans out there saying, oh, now that we have a home and away retro kit, they'll become the, the full-time home and away. Do you think we're going to see more of this white jersey, or do you think it'll be a one-and-done for the Flames? Well, I'm sure that the team will probably, especially if it's popular, they'll probably end up using it more regularly than... Uh, it's sort of like when you see uh, teams using, using their stadium series jerseys and th- that kind of thing. Uh, Every team always has a retro night, and we always wear our reds for retro night, but it'd be kind of neat if we took our whites on the road when we play someone else on their retro night. Yeah, or force the other team to come in their colors, because, you know, do some extra laundry, guys. (laughs) Yeah, no, you could definitely do it that way, too. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see five or six uh, games out of it this year, maybe one or two next year. I just don't think this becomes, as some people have said, the permanent Flames away jersey. I think there will be changes soon, but I think it'll be retro inspired, not just going back to the retro. Yeah, like if they went that way, like it would be an upgrade to what we currently have because our jerseys are not very good. The only reason I don't opinion. think they go that way, everyone that's going to want one is going to buy one, and there's no point in going to it if you've already sold them all. Yeah, and that's it. It would become like okay, yeah, that's great. It's just like the Oilers when they went back to their original jerseys. It's like okay, great. Um, that's boring now, and now what? And what I could see, if you remember the playoffs last year, the Flames went all retro for home. I could see them going all retro, no matter if they're home or road in the playoffs. Yeah, I could see that. It would be. Wouldn't it be neat to win the Stanley Cup? again in the same jerseys we won it in the one time yeah exactly and uh, you know uh, i think montreal will have to improve so that way we can win it in their barn again but you know (laughs) well lots happened this summer let's uh go back to the start of the summer and talk about what's happened we won't spend a lot of time today talking about the arena deal we'll maybe save that for a slow week during the season but the fact that the flames have announced there will be a new barn coming and shortly after that, they made another announcement, Flames fans. I think we're probably debating the most over the summer, which I didn't think we could get more debate than the arena deal, and that was acquiring Milan Lucic from Edmonton in exchange for James Neal and a conditional draft pick in 2020. The condition is if James, James Neal scores 21 goals and M- Milan Lucic scores 10 or fewer goals than Neal this season, then Edmonton gets our pick. If not, no pick for them. So this has been a pretty polarizing trade, Matt. What are your thoughts on the Lucic deal? In normal circumstances, you'd be going, eh, this might not work. You have to remember, though, that there's an X factor in that the Edmonton Oilers are a terrible, terrible, terrible hockey team. And you forgot one. Terrible, 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 terrible now hockey continue. team. Now um, continue. Anyhow, uh, they... You look at, like, everybody, basically, who's ever departed the Oilers, they magically bounce back into being what they were before going to What I like to call to the, du- the uh, well, Dubnik. we've talked about this before, yeah, the Dubnik effect. I was thinking there's a few other players, but you and I have talked about the Dubnik effect before. Yeah, and it it's the market inefficiency, and I think that, you know, with the Flames signing Davidson and inviting uh, Tobias Reeder and uh, Eric Griba to camp, that... The Flames are, and signing Cam Talbot even, uh, that the Flames are trying to take advantage of that little market inefficiency because most of their players, once they leave Edmonton, bounce back. And if Lucic bounces back even halfway to what he was when he was with LA, 
The Flames have a 45-point guy who's tough as hell to play against. He got which, 55 points his, uh, uh, one year in L.A., so half of that would even be a 30-point guy. Yeah, it, like, it, 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 that would be a huge thing. It, like, especially for how bad James Neal was for the Flames last year. Like, he was atrocious, basically. Like, the, the single worst player on the team. And, that, like, a lot of us, like ourselves included, were trying to be optimistic of, oh, maybe he might bounce back, but, yeah, no. You he thought was... he might be our playoff warrior. Yeah, I did, because, well, you know, you have to expect... Earn your five million somehow. Exactly. Like, do something, guy. Like, what, you know. But now he's in Edmonton, so it's their problem now, and we don't have to worry about that. And... Just getting out of that Neil contract, I think, is worth it. Yeah, we're not going to be able to buy out Lucic, but if you look at how the cap is structured, like his cap hit, uh, I think it's now 5.2 uh, cuz the Oilers retained 750,000. Like that it's high, but it's not egregiously so, and especially if he becomes a 35-40 point guy, like, you're basically paying the bruiser advantage over what you're paying Michael for a leak. I mean, like, you'd be looking then at a very similar player to a Kachuk, right? The guy who can be an offensive threat and have some of that sandpaper to him. Yeah, and in terms of Corsi and all the advanced stats, Lucic was actually the Oilers' best player last year, which is shocking, but also not shocking. Um there's a reason why Lucic was very good throughout his career. And I think that he, especially if he plays with certain players on this team, will have a very positive impact on the team. And I wouldn't be shocked if, like, once Kachuk and uh, Mangiapane are signed, that you'll see the third line being uh, Sam Bennett, Derek Ryan, and Lucic. And I think that... It, there's a number of lines that Lucic can play on just to bring that physical edge. And yeah, he's a little on the slow side, but still he's a very smart player. And I think we're going to see a lot of him on special teams. Yeah. And I don't know about you. I don't think by the end of the season, Froelich is still a flame. I think maybe he gets no. traded at the deadline or before. And I could see on special teams, Lucic filling that role on what is now the three M line. Yeah, that's a possibility too. Not five on five necessarily, but I could see putting him down there, sort of your shutdown guy. It, it just depends basically on how Lucic plays. If he re bounces back to form, then yeah, you throw him on that 3M line the full time. It's just you don't really know what you have right at this point. I think one thing I heard from fans a lot this summer, and you probably did too, is... Why did the Flames trade for that for James Neal? And I had to remind people, James Neal was, as you said, he did nothing last year. Like, it was a bad contract. You can't just give it away. GMs in this team are smarter than your Xbox. You can't just say, uh, hey, we'll give you James Neal. Will you give me whatever else? Like, you had this was a scenario where I think the Flames got a good deal for what they had in that it was probably that or buy him out. And it really became whose bad contract are we willing to take on? Yeah, exactly, and it sucks that, you know, Lou, James Neal was that bad that you had to go make this trade. But, on the other hand, there is the possibility that Lucic could be good. Or at least more useful than James Neal was. And I think that him just being in the lineup, he'll have a more positive impact than James Neal. But, yeah, I, I think you're right. A lot of people are selling Luch short. He's not going to be, say, our first-line right winger, but I think no. he could be, just like Bennett is, a useful depth piece on this team. Yeah, and like if he chips in 35, 40 points and like bounces back a little bit... We then, won't feel he's but, overpaid as much. Hell, it would be like, oh, that's a perfectly viable contract, and yeah, no worries there. Uh, you know, if he gets 40 points, like five and a quarter, that's fine. They, you know, you look around the league and, like, that's pretty much the going right now. So, and then you don't have somebody who's physical like Lucic. So, you know, it it's, could be a good thing. And the so X Factor... For those wondering, sorry, let me just interrupt you a second, Matt. For those wondering, we have Lucic. He's 31 right now and he's locked up through 2022-2023 at $5.25 million a year. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, it's one of those things that 
players like Lucic are hard to get, period, just because there's not a lot of overly physical players in the league now. So that too is a commodity. It, not, like that's why Ryan Reeves went for a first round pick and like the Flames have been trying to get him. And it it'll be interesting to see how he fits in, but I think he will fit in. And I don't think that he fit in well with the Oilers team because I think too much was being asked of him. Like I think at this point in his career he's a good complementary player and the Oilers they only have three guys that up front that actually are NHL forwards so besides Lucic so it's like you're being relied on to being one of the guys that's supposed to like drive the play I think he's also being looked at to be an off-ice leader as well and I think here he's stepping into a great leadership structure already put in place yeah exactly and I think he was the like if the Oilers were competing for the cup properly like they should have been based on how like everything that ha- happened into the lead up i think he would have been fine it's just that it's also hard for a player like lucic who is a physically intense guy to get up for games when you're out of the playoffs and it's november 1st and you know like it's hard it, and like I, i've seen players repeatedly throughout like the last 20 years that if they're that type of like i need to be playing for something type mentality if they're on a bottom feeder like they're gonna struggle because it's hard to get up for something when you know no matter what you do the team's gonna suck and miss the playoffs i think i was in a minority here in calgary when this deal was done a lot of people were up in arms and said it was a terrible deal i thought it was a good deal same here Um, so, you know, I was I know there's a lot of Flames fans I was defending this trade to in a way and saying, you know what? Again, all things considered, if you know, we we're not going to trade James Neal for let's say a useful piece at a good contract. So, all things considered, I think Tree did what he does best and finds a way to get, you know, a good deal done and I think this is the best he was going to get and I'm happy with the deal. I mean, do I do I kind of wish that you know, we could get in a DeLorean and not have signed Neil, yes, but with the hand we were dealt, this is, I think, the best we could do. Yeah, and, like, if James Neal was James Neal last season, then this trade doesn't happen and everything's fine. But James Neal was one of the worst players in the entire NHL last year. He went from and being the real deal to make a deal James Neal. Yeah, the great value from Walmart <laughs> type, you know... Cheap and you off know, brand hopefully version. They'll well in, hopefully they'll do well in Edmonton. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't see that happening, frankly. Well, you know, there's got to be a there's got to be a best player on that team. Yeah, they have one. <laughs> and the you know, yeah, the others are not going to be very good this year again. Tree didn't make a big free agent signing this year, as we talked about in our last episode, but we did get uh, two deals done later in the summer that we were all waiting on, and those were the Bennett and Riddick deals for our RFAs. Well, Sam we Bennett... did sign uh, Cam Talbot. Yeah, I guess, but I'm, I'm, I guess I'm just talking big dollars. Like, you know, we've seen oh, yeah, the, true the enough. Brower, we've seen the Neil, like this year, he managed to keep his money in his pocket. True. Um, Because he had other deals to get done like these two. So Bennett signed a two year deal for 5.1 total, which is 2.25 million. So about, what, $600,000 raise over what he got this year? Yeah, which is fair. And Riddick signed a two year, 2.75 million. Uh, When I look at these deals, I think that the Bennett deal, while it's kind of what I expected, I think it's a little high. And while the. Uh, and when I look at the Riddick deal, I'm quite pleased because we're paying him exactly the same as Talbot. So we're not setting one guy up to be, you know, the starter and one to be the backup. I think that they will probably split minutes and they're getting paid exactly the same. So I really like that. It's lower than I thought we'd get Riddick for, but I'm quite surprised by it. Yeah, well, Bennett, I think it's partially the intangible aspect of it that he's a physical player and intense. And he was... Perhaps the Flames' best forward in the playoffs. And yeah, I mean, I'm glad we brought him back. I just don't know that he should have gone. I mean, he was making sub $2 million last year. I would have gone yeah. about 2 2.2. Yeah, well, I'm not really objecting to that, and I think that he's going to have a breakout year this year. So, I, I'm well, I'm hoping so anyway. And, yeah, we'll see. I think he's... 
apparently been working on his shot release more this off season, so hopefully that translates into some positive things for him. Uh, the even at the two and a half, like that's it's not a bad fine. deal. It's just yeah. a little higher than I would have liked to have seen. Yeah, like two four would have probably been fine. And he's but, still an RFA at the end of yeah. this deal. Yeah, so like it's not a. I'm not overly concerned no, at all. Good deal. What do you think of the Riddick deal? Like I said, I was expecting about the three million range, but I'm really glad we got him sub three. We got to remember, as much as we like him here, this guy's you know doesn't even really have a full NHL season under his belt yet. So I think this is a good deal for the Flames. Yeah, he. It, it's less than Koskinen, uh, but that's yeah. Oilers. That's why awesome. they had to move Lucic to pay for Koskinen. Yeah. Uh, Riddick, he was really good until he got hurt, and then he struggled. And that's the problem with young goaltenders, is that you don't really know what you have. And it's just like Mike Smith. When he got hurt, he was, like, up until that point, the year prior, he was great. He was an all-star, even. It's just then, after that, uh, up until, frankly, the playoffs last year, he was completely terrible and you know he was just marginally better towards the end of the season and then in the playoffs he was fine but you know it you don't really know like how long that injury is going to impact Riddich or if he's gonna bounce back and we'll have to just wait and see with him and that's the thing with any young goaltender he might turn on another gear and be awesome and then it's a great case, value yeah or he might struggle and be the backup in which case 2.75 for a backup's not bad i guess and i just love that we have our whole goalie tandem signed for what we were essentially paying smith last year yeah the thing i'm really happy about is getting cam talbot and he's a very good goaltender who was basically asked to do everything because it's the oilers do you think he will be like Lucic and have that, you know, left the Oilers better season? Yeah, I think that he will be... Well, you got to figure it. Mike Smith, frankly, was one of the single worst goalies in the league last year. If Cam Talbot is just average, not bad, just average or good, just right down the middle, that is a completely massive upgrade in that. And we saw a couple years ago when Talbot was actually playing good, like how he dragged the Oilers to the second round. And that team wasn't very much different than the team that they have now. So, you know, it's... We'll see. Uh, you know, I, it, I think it, it's a great tandem. Yeah. it it There's question marks, but there's a potential significant upside to it. And, I, and like I said earlier, I like that they're getting paid exactly the same. Because as you mentioned, we don't know who's going to be the starter here. Maybe no. Talbot bounces back. Maybe Riddick's injury hurts him. You got two guys. You're saying, you know what? Your exact equals on the payroll. One of you break out. And I like yeah. that. Yeah, figure it out. And, and, I, and I wouldn't be surprised if part of the sale to, um, to David Riddick was just that. You know, we want you and Cam to make exactly the same. We'll give you an extra year. Prove to us that, you know, after that, you should get a bigger deal. And even next year, like, if Riddick struggles and is the backup, two, 275 is no big deal for one more year as the backup. Yeah, for a year I could do it. I wouldn't want to sign him long-term to that as a backup, but for one year no. we can probably find a way to swallow it. Yep. Um, well, let's talk about the two RFAs that aren't signed. I think one more important on this team than other, and we've got Matthew Kachuk and uh, Andrew Mangiapani still not signed by this team. Let's start with Mangiapani because I think there's probably less to talk about there. Uh, reports uh, are that Mangiapani's t- people probably want over a million, and you team- know his people uh, that are advising him are really doing him a significant disservice by having him hold out. Yeah. Like it, even if it's a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars difference, if he misses most of training camp, he is not going to be very good this season. Nope, and and, and I would argue it will, may not even start in the NHL. Yeah, and it might ruin his entire career 
it, like it, it is that significant. Like he's at that age where like he did have a really good end to last season. He should take a one year deal. Uh, you know, and the Flames offer is slightly low, but you know, like knock your off your ask down to like say one point zero two five. Get the deal done, get your butt in camp, and go. Like, there's no excuse. Like, it, he has an opportunity, like, especially if the Flames do trade for a leak, there's going to need to be somebody on that second line. Yeah. And he played really good last year. He could take that spot if he plays well. But if he's sitting on the sidelines, well, you know, he's not seizing that opportunity or any opportunity, and he might end up screwing himself just because, oh, I'm getting $100,000 less than I feel I deserve. Like, it, that, like that is not good Well, I don't know if it's how he feels advice. he deserves or his, his management has told him he deserves. Yeah. The fact Whoever of the matter said, is, this kid has 13 NHL points. Like, we like him. He's a nice guy. Fans like him. He's got 13 points. To me, when you have 13 points, you take whatever the nice man offers you. You don't get much of a say in it. Like, I think 800000 reasonable cost. Give him a two-way. Tell him, you know what? We're going to give you a two-way. Don't let us use it. Earn your way up here. Because for every day he's out, Dylan Dubé, Tobias Reeder, Devontae smith Pelly are looking more and more poised to make the roster. I think if he holds out, he's probably going to be off to Europe, and I think that might be the end of him. Yeah. Uh, I'm not arguing with you. I like, mean, he, it's I a really could bad see him decision. becoming the next Giordano, and he goes there and he does wonders for a year. But I think, you know what, this could just be a sign that he goes to Europe, and that's the last we hear of him. And I mean, again, as much as we like him, this is not a player this team needs. They will find somebody to replace him. They already have guys to replace him. So all he's doing is moving his name further down the GM's list because we're seeing what other guys are doing. Well, so you got to remember really the Flames. Well, you got to remember the Flames drafted uh, Jacob Peltier. Um, basically the same profile of guy. And he's going to be in the NHL probably in two years. It, you know, like. It, well, you and I talked at the end of last season that Dubé probably deserves to be in this team, but there's no room for him. On Andrew's pretty much saying, hey, Dubes, I'm giving you a spot. Yeah, exactly. Like, it, it's just really, like, whoever's advising him is not very smart. Like, you know, it it would be one thing if he had, like, a full season where he was great. Then, sure, hold out for, you know, like, say, $2 million if he was great all season. But he had a good portion of the season late in the year after the trade deadline where he got hot. Well, that's great. Awesome. Yay. But that was like three weeks where you were good. Uh, is that yeah, who he, you are? Like, well, he only played 22 games. Yeah. like Or no, sorry, just, 44 last year. My bad. Yeah. Like he went for a stretch of like nearly 30 games where he didn't get a goal. Like, you know, like that, well, that's, that's why what you're it's, saying. You, have thir- you have 13 points to your name. You don't get to negotiate. You take whatever they offer you. Yeah. Like I can understand like wanting a one way deal. Sure. You know, that makes perfect sense because, you know, like that would be a sticking point. But if it's just dollars, you're being a little ridiculous. Would you be willing, if you were him, then to leave money on the table to get a one way? If the team says, we'll pay a little bit more yeah. on a two way, if you want a one way, you're going to have to, you're going to have to pay for it. Yeah, well, yeah, it would make more sense for him because he'd be getting, say, like 800,000 guaranteed yeah. versus like, like 100 if it was change say- if he was in Stockton. That's it. Like I'm kind of thinking, if the team said, "Hey, we'll give you eight fifty on a two way and seven seventy on a one way," I'd take the seven seventy. Yeah, because it's guaranteed, mm-hmm. and you know, has a perfect opportunity to establish himself as a go to guy on an elite team, which could make him a lot of money. Because like you got to figure, the Flames actually have players where if you pass the puck to them, they know how to receive it and shoot the puck. You know, the, there's a lot of teams like Edmonton where that's not the case. And your stats can actually get inflated because of the fact that you're playing on a good team. Which means more money for you in the long term. And, like, you're luck- you you see teams like Tampa Bay or Chicago in the past where, like, their depth players get signed for ridiculous amounts and then suck when they move elsewhere. Like Andrew Shaw, for example. And... 
you know, like he could be that guy who gets that really good contract from another team down the line because he's playing on a really good team now. You know, but he's just it like whoever's advising him is really not doing him any favors because I mean, like it, feeling personal feelings aside of if you like him or not, Dylan Dubé is getting seven seventy eight. Yeah. You know, Alan Quine's getting seven thirty five. I can't make an argument of why Manjapani should get a million if those guys are in the seven hundreds. Yeah, I agree. You know, and, you might like him. You and might Tobias like the cut Reader, of his yeah, well, t- Tobias Reader basically does everything that Manjapani does, except he might not have as much offensive potential. But again, he played for Edmonton, and you know, again, <laughs> you know, why well, I, I think if I think if Manji's not there, it's Dubé's spot. Yeah, but you know, a guy like Reader could easily come mm-hmm. in and play and take his spot yeah you know he I, he was a very effective player for arizona for all those years we're so, recording this on saturday the 14th training camp is already open i'm honestly surprised it didn't get done i kind of expected i'm the night shocked before. i thought the night before camp he'd sign his name on whatever number they gave him and just be here and be ready the fact he's holding out i don't even know i mean at this point if there's even still an offer if if tree says you know what we'll get some other deals done and we'll see if there's still money for you that's what i do if i was the gm yeah, uh, he, uh, you know, if it was me and I was the GM, you'd go right down to the bottom of the priority list. And well, that's it. You know, Reader's here. Devontae smith Pelly's here. We'll see if those guys are worth signing. If they are, we'll sign them. If there's still money, we'll call you. Yep. So I, I think, I hate to say it, but I, I think this could be the beginning of the end for Mangiapane as a flame and as probably an NHL regular. Yep. And brilliant. Yeah, you know, so. like this is one of the more stupid things I've seen any player do in the last fifteen years. Like that's it's really that bad. Yeah, like, no, I, I would agree with you, and I can't remember last time you had a bit player like that hold out. Yeah, like you're not Mitch Marner. No, like, dude, like come on. So let me ask you this: If the season starts and he's not signed, would you have any qualms about flipping the asset as part of a package? Not really, no. Like, you know, he's, re- he's replaceable entirely. Well, like, that's it. Let's you know. say we trade Froleek for something, and you say Froleek and the rights to manage your panty. It's like, okay, you're dead to us. Move on. Yep. Have I fun elsewhere. Same. Yeah. I- enjoy life elsewhere. You know, like, it's it just really... It's stupid. Yeah. It, you know, like, you have a really great opportunity, and you're pissing it away because of a couple of bucks. And like, you know what? I mean, take less money now. If you are the player you say you are, you'll make it up down the road somewhere. Oh, yeah. Like, you you know, like, it, we saw how good he could be. Like, and it's not like the Flames are offering, like, a three-year contract and insisting on that. They're offering a one-year deal. So it. if you take blow it. the doors off this year and, say, score 35 points, you're going to get over $2 million next year. Well, you know, even if he does marginally well, um, Zarnik's deal's up at the end of the year. Zarnik's making 1.25. Take the deal this year and make Zarnik money next year. You're good. Yeah, or more like, than that, uh, depending on how good. Yeah. Like, you know, like it's you're just, just, he's just not in a negotiation position. At that point, you just take whatever's offered. Yeah, it's like, I had a good three weeks of hockey. Give me all the money. And it's like... um okay and you know i admire true living for standing pat for not saying well we like the kid you know let's give in like like i said you've got to look at who's making what on the team because if you give in to Mangiapani, you're gonna have to give in to everybody so i admire them for stay for yeah, saying this no, I, take it I agree entirely and the flames have plenty of prospects like frankly like you could insert matthew phillips into the team in the yeah, fourth line I, I spot. Just, I just think know. that Dubé is the next guy up. Oh, I know. But we, like we beyond Dubé, like we mm-hmm. have other young guys that can come up and realistically play in Mangiapane's spot. Like there's plenty and, of guys. And all Andrew's <laughs> doing is giving them that spot, right? Like it was probably his to lose. Yeah. Now it's, it, it's an empty spot for somebody to gain. Like you're just giving someone else your spot on the depth charts. Even if you come back, you're going to be lower now. No, oh, I know. Like it, it, this whole thing is just... It is one of the more, most idiotic things I've ever seen, and you know I'm not I'm not trying. I like Manjapani. Like I've spoken with uh, we both spoken with him a couple of nice times. Nice kid, but I yeah, don't want nice to let the fact he's a nice kid cloud my judgment. He's not worth a million no. bucks. No, and yeah, it's just 
I, you and I are uh, nice guys too. No one's paying us a million bucks. Exactly. You so, know. Well, let's talk about the other holdout. This is probably the bigger news and the one we should be worried about, and that's Matthew Kachuk, 21-year-old left winger. Still doesn't have a deal done. Uh, I don't know about you, Matt. I have no doubt this deal gets done by the yeah. start of the season, and I'm not even worried about him not being a camp. I mean, knowing his dad, knowing him, he's going to be in shape. He's going to come in. I'm not worried about this deal getting done at all. I wouldn't even be surprised if there's a deal in principle and the Flames are just waiting to move some cash. Yeah, Uh the only thing I'd be concerned of is if he misses the entire camp or into the season, just because usually players that do miss the entire training camp tend to have a really bad year. I think it'll happen so, like the uh, the Johnny Goudreau deal a couple years ago where it gets signed like the day before regular season opens. Yeah, yeah, and like I'm not overly concerned. Uh, you know, it, it's one of those things that I think like all of the RFAs around the league were – all like oh well we want tons of money and then all of the teams are like uh we're all wanting to re-sign our own guy we can trade you to another team who has an rfa and you can go and get their cap hit and we'll get theirs but like there's no team sitting on the sidelines with 20 million dollars ready to sign you so it's like um yeah y- you know you want that kind uh, of what money, you doing call ottawa call Edmonton, maybe call Seattle, see if they'd want to, you know, bring in because they can start making moves in January. Other than that, no one's got money. Yeah, so it's like uh, you can come with our offer and sign with us, or you can sit out. You know, like I will be shocked if he if Kachuk is not in the lineup for the opening game of the season. Yeah, same here. Like, what do you think the chance is? And I've heard people say this that it's like the Nylander deal last year in Toronto, and he doesn't play until Christmas or later. I think that would be like something would have to go wrong. Frankly, I think that the Flames could easily move out a couple of players if they need to to make room. Like it's here's here's a crazy thought. If it's that bad in the negotiations. I would not hesitate to see if we could even move the asset at that point. Like, if, if it's, no, 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 no. If he no. doesn't want to be here to the point yeah, that we no, can't make a deal, no, 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 no. I yeah, if he doesn't no. want to be here, I don't want him here. Like, you yeah, do the no. deal, get it under cap. I'd look to move the asset. Yeah, no, I there. I'd literally trade pretty much three quarters of the team before I'd even look at that. And yeah, no. It, but I mean, if he doesn't want to be here so much that he's not playing till Christmas, you still want to say, "Hey, you're you don't yeah, want to be part of it. It'll get we done. Want you part of it? Yeah, it'll get done. I, not, I have no doubt it does. But you know, I've heard you know, people for say Elite we going. Just... Yeah, for a leak going to Anaheim, mm-hmm. I think would be like the you know because uh, Eves and Kessler are both mm-hmm. out for the year. I think that would be more likely to happen. I, I am not I would not be surprised things. if the two sides have a deal in pay, in principle they just haven't faxed it to the league because the Flames are trying to move like you said for a leak or somebody like that to make some room. Yeah, and th- frankly the Flames don't need like you look at Provorov he's signed for like six point eight five for six years. Uh, Morrissey he signed for like six million a year. Uh, Based on, you know, Marner with 11 million, like, based on that, Kachuk should be in, like, the 775 range. And we happen to have 7 million available, and you can go 20% over till the season starts, so you could get that done now. Yeah, like, it's not that big of a deal. No. Like, uh, it'll it'll get done. I'm hearing a lot of sky is falling talk, but like I said, I'm shocked if he's not in the lineup come come the start of the season in, in, in October. Yeah. I think a lot of things would have to go wrong for that to oh, happen, I agree. and I, yeah. I don't see that. No, and I don't. I don't see the Flames or Kachuk being acrimonious to that point. Like, knowing, if he didn't want to be here, he would have been moved already over the summer. Yeah, and Kachuk's enthusiastic about winning, and I think yep. that he's. It's just getting the dollars right, then the Flames having the. Dick around I wouldn't with the be numbers. surprised if they've got numbers they like, but as people said, let's wait and see what Marner gets, just to be sure. <clears throat> yeah, and exactly. Now, and now that Marner signed, I'm. I mean, you and I are recording Saturday the 14th. I'm guessing, just a pure guess, we get this deal done in 48 hours. Like I think now that we've seen what Marner gets, you can negotiate with Kachuk and get it done. Yeah, I'm assuming that like virtually all of the 
holdout RFAs get signed in the next week. And, yeah. Like, My guess is by the time everyone listens to the show, by the time you're hearing <clears throat> us in your ear holes, this deal, deal's done. Yeah. I wouldn't be shocked. I think everyone, all the holdout R- RFAs except maybe Manju Penny. Because, like I said, if it was me, you're at the bottom of the list now, kid. Yep. Um, well, let's talk about the other player that left and came back. The weirdest thing I've seen in a long time, even more than the Mangiapane not wanting to take you know money, is the Flames uh, called Michael Stone in and said, we're going to give you some money to go away. Then yeah. he went away. Then they called him back and said, uh, we changed our mind. Control Z, Control Z. Let's re-sign you. They, they bought him out and brought him back in the same summer. I don't think I've ever seen that happen. Get the hell out of here. Hey, why are you leaving? Get your ass back here. Why are you late for work today? You fired me. Oh, just kidding. That never happened. Get your ass back in here. Like, you know, we (laughs) we paid him money to go away. And can we take that money back now? Can we undo the buyout if he's coming back? Like, I guess technically we're saving a little bit of money because they re-signed Michael Stone to a $700,000 deal. But, Matt, I think this was not the original plan. It wasn't let's release him and bring him back for cheaper. This happened because... Yusuf Valamaki got an ACL injury over the summer, isn't expected to probably be in the lineup till at least January. And I think the team was probably saying there's other guys out there like McDonald, like Fanoff, other guys, but, you know, dance with the devil you know. Do you think that's probably where they're at? Yeah. And Stone is a serviceable sixth defenseman. Like, it, you know, he was better before his knee injury uh, a couple of years ago with Arizona. But uh, he... He's just a serviceable guy that you can throw in the lineup and he'll play well. So we're paying and, Stone 700000 and we have a cap penalty on Stone for $1.16 million. Yeah. Weird. Yeah, it's a bizarre, but hey, sometimes life hands you weirdness. And I can this just, is one I of those can just things. see that they release him, the equipment manager, and they're starting to take his name off the stalls. Then it's, hey, what are you doing? Put that back on. Uh, you see, they opened camp and they're like, "Hey, where where did Stone go? Like, he, he's supposed to be here." Hey, dude, what what's up? Why are you late for uh, work today? Yeah, and oh, we bought you out. When did that happen? I don't have any recollection of that. <laughs> oh, that was that crazy night after drinking at the Stampede. That's yeah. what happened. I blacked out for nine hours. Yeah. Crap. Uh, so get get back here. <laughs> we, we, we joke. It, it is weird, but I have no problem with Stone being on this team. I think he's a good, serviceable defenseman. Um, I think the interesting thing now in my mind is, does Oliver Shillington make the team? I think for me, when I saw that Valimaki was going to be out, my first thought was, that means Shillington's made the team. I, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if Stone becomes your number seven. Yeah, and 700000 for that's fine. Well, that's no. it. 700000 is league minimum these days. Yeah, so no big deal. Yeah, and I think you'll probably have Anderson Shillington as your ba- as your bottom pair, and Stone becomes your number seven. And like you said, a serviceable you know bottom three guy. Yep. So weird to see, but I guess good to have him back. Yeah, exactly. And you know, we'll see with McDonald and Griba. I think that those guys might be signed to uh, Stockton type deals. Uh, you need sort of at like least all- one veteran to wear the C down there. Yeah, and, like, frankly, the Flames, like, the Stockton Heat suck, and they need as much help as they can, and I wouldn't be shocked with all of the tryouts if they didn't all get contracts for Stockton, um, unless they get better offers elsewhere, but I would be shocked, frankly, if all of those players weren't signed. Yeah, yeah, very well, could be. We'll talk about some more tryouts in a little bit here. Um, anything else to say about Valimaki's ACL? The fir- the only thing I can really say is what a crappy time to have an ACL injury, but I guess at the same time, I'm glad it's now and not mid-season so we can build around it. Yeah, exactly. Instead of going, oh, crap, what do we do now? You know, if he's, we, your, if he's on your top pairing, and your top two, and you go, oh, crap, now we're going to have to make a move or bring somebody in, at least now we say, okay, we can anticipate him coming back mid-season. Let's find, like you said, Stone, uh, McDonald. Let's find the right guy and build around that. Yeah, and at least it, we didn't have to waste an asset like a fourth-round pick or something to pick up a depth guy down yeah. the road. It. It's just unfortunate, but injuries happen, and it doesn't seem to be one of those injuries that should screw him up that long. It's just, 
you know, he has to get better and then he should be fine. So And hopefully... people have said it's kind of weird to look at it this way, but I, I've said to people, I'd rather he gets hurt now. He's young. He can bounce back better than get that injury five, six years down the road when it'll probably become a nagging injury. Like, I think he's hungry and he's ready and he will put in the rehab that's required. I have a feeling that when Valimaki, you know, let's say this time next year, we don't notice any difference in his game. Yeah. I wouldn't be shocked if that was the case. And hopefully he plays well when he gets back and hopefully that's sooner than later but we'll see so moving on from the players we brought in um this is an odd stat so if you look at the guys that uh, true living has bought out usually when a new gm comes into a team they're buying out the last guy's deals and that happened with one deal which was shane o'brien that he bought out but he bought out uh mason raymond lance boma troy brower Michael Stone, like these are all his own deals yeah. that he signed and then gone, I don't like them anymore, I'm going to buy them out. Based on those, based on the Lucic deal, based on other things that we've talked about, we've called him a wizard in the past. Are, are you starting to lose any confidence in Tree or do you think they're still the best guy to helm this team? Not in the slightest. Um, you see, it takes a big person to realize that they made a mistake and take the appropriate step to fix it. And, you know, I would much rather have to put up with buyout penalties than having guys like Troy Brower on the books still. Or having to deal with James Neal and, like, hoping that he'll be an effective nhl or this season, which I don't think so. You know, and... He admits his mistakes, and he rectifies it. And, yeah, it it's unfortunate that... Part of the problem is, is that the Flames needed certain things. Like, the year that we acquired Troy Brower, we didn't have a natural right winger in the organization. Like, Froelich was a left shot right winger. And we had literally nobody. And the Flames only had, like, $5 million worth of cap space or so. Um, and the only two right-wingers that were actual NHL players were Troy Brower and David Backus. Well, Backus has actually been significantly worse than Troy Brower, which is shocking. Um, and Brower. And Brower, at least, was an NHL player while he was here. He wasn't you know, a four million dollar player, but he was at least an NHL player. You paid the July first premium. Yeah. And you were expecting more from him. I was expecting more from him. Flames fans were expecting more from him. Trill Living was expecting more from him. And he fell off the face of the earth. And that happens sometimes with unrestricted free agents. They hit that certain age where their skills decline and hit, you know, we saw that last year with James Neal. Like, Neil was a very consistent 25-plus goal guy his entire career. And you expect when you're coming off a 25-goal season that you're getting a guy who can score at least 20 goals. Because, you know, that makes sense. And he had a very good shot, which that's what the Flames needed. So it made sense. And then the guy falls off the face of the earth and scores seven goals. Like, you can't... You can only do so much to extrapolate what's going to happen based off of the information you have at hand. And when you have a guy like Neil who scores consistently his entire career, then comes to your team and scores seven goals while not being really injured for much of the season, and like no real reason why he should have been that bad, like, there's only so much that you're responsible for. And, like, you can't... You can only do your best. And, like, when we signed Neil, it seemed like a good thing. It just really didn't turn out that way. And he rectified it by swapping him out for something that the Flames did need, which is that physically imposing player who's decent and can has won in the past. And... You know, while Lucic isn't great, you know, he's better than last year's version of James Neal. And Well, as as I said earlier, he's the best we could get when we're trying to move, you know, damaged goods, essentially. 
Yeah, and he's willing to admit when he makes a mistake and does what's in the best interest of the team, and that is the important thing. He doesn't put his own ego of, oh, I signed this guy, so he must play. No, he's, I signed him, but he really sucks. Let's get rid of him so that way we can get something else in that might work better. Yeah, and the yeah. reason I put this into our discussion is I, I, you know, I've heard people say it. Should Tree lose his job for all this? I totally agree with what you just said. He makes mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. How many GMs end up living with the mistake because they don't want to look like they're wrong and put a crappy guy in their lineup who shouldn't be there or force a guy into the first line because he's paid you know the most on the team? Tree says, you know what? I made a mistake. I'll buy it out and I'll do it again. And I really admire that about him. Yeah. So do I, because, you know, like a guy like Lucic has just as good of a chance of bouncing back as Neil does, and if Lucic does, he's going to be more impactful than Neil would be. So, we'll see. And I mean, the the only of those deals that we can look at and say probably shouldn't have been done was probably the Boma one. Like you said, all the others were, you know what, we took a chance on something, it didn't work out, let's just move on from the experiment. Yeah, and that was signing a guy right after he had a career year and mm -hmm. expecting him, you know. Unfortunately, like, at the la end of that year, he broke his hand, and I think that's part of the reason why his shot kind of went away after that. Yeah. But, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I admired Tree for saying, you know what, I didn't do right. I'm going to, you know, buy out of it and try again. And I also admire him for, hopefully it looks like, realizing some of his mistakes, which is overpaying for veteran grit on July 1st and not doing that this year. So I'm hoping that my dad used to say when I was a kid, it's okay to make a mistake, but you shouldn't make the same mistake twice. Otherwise, you're not learning from your mistake. And I'm hoping we're starting to see some of that with Tree here. Mm -hmm. I agree. So I, I, I'm hoping Tree is here for as long as he wants to be here. Like I know GMs often have an expiry date. I could honestly see this guy being like a Kenny Holland was in Detroit, and as long as you want to be here, we'll keep you here. Well, th you have to also look at other things like drafting record, for example. And the last few drafts for the Flames, even though they haven't really had a ton of high picks, have been fairly good. And, like, Matthias Pedersen looks like an impact player in the making. And that was a sixth-round pick. And, you know, Pet uh, Peltier was a very good first round pick and Nikolaev is interesting and Wolf looks interesting and a handful of other guys that I didn't mention look interesting you know and that's good and you know the Flames have turned into the elite team in our division and are going to probably win the division again this year uh, just because you know San Jose took a huge step back and nobody else really improved significantly um so we'll see and you know like it, it, the flames are having their most successful period that they've had since the early 90s and he's the architect of that so yeah you keep him on as long as he wants and, it. and not only with players we've seen him go through more coaches than i can remember gm go through too but again it's kind of like hey i made a mistake let's get rid of that coach let's bring in another one like he's not a guy who's afraid to say it didn't work Let's yeah, well, different. you know, like, uh, Glenn Gullitson, he talks the good game of, like, how to build a team, blah, blah, blah. He just was really not good at handling a, a team. And to me, he's Jim Playfair. He's a great assistant. Yeah. Not a he, good He's coach. very good at tactics and all that kind of stuff and came up with the same system as Sullivan and Tortorella and all that. And... He knows how to get it to work. He just doesn't know how to get the players to work in that system. And that's why things went off the rails as much as they did. And, you know, the Flames adjusted by getting someone who knows how to handle the players better. Mm -hmm. and but again, there's a lot of coaches that would have said, I hired this guy. I'm going to keep him here for his contract. Like, yeah. this is a GM who's not afraid to say, hey, it didn't work. Let's find somebody else. Yep, I agree. And that's so a good thing. Yeah, well, Matt, I think that covers the summer. What do you think? Pretty much, yeah. It's training camp time, and we've seen two games so far. We saw the rookies play. There's no Penticton tournament this year. So what's better than Penticton? Red Deer. 
let's go play in Red Deer. And the Flames played the Oilers prospects in Red Deer. I guess it was kind of the, you know, that way nobody has home ice advantage. I don't know how you pick a home or road team in Red Deer. Do you flip a coin? But um, Calgary ended up winning one nothing over Edmonton in Red Deer. And then the second Young Flames game, as they call it here, the Dome was a 3-1 win over the Oilers. I think if I was the coach, I would have just said to this team, you guys are on a team that has a prospect pool. I have no idea who these guys are. If you lose to them, we're skating laps tomorrow. Good, good luck, boys. Yeah. Like, there was maybe one or two names I even knew looking at that Edmonton lineup. It was a terrible lineup. Yeah. I'm well, honestly surprised we had a 0-0 and OT in the first game. Yeah. Well, like, uh, Saga Doolin was good. And, and you know, Wolf liked was him good. at rookie camp, too. Yeah. yeah. So, Actually, like, Saga Doolin, I would not be shocked if he's Riddick 2.0 where he plays a year or two in Stockton and then is in the NHL. Like, he is very composed in his movements, and usually when goalies are like that, they tend to make the NHL, even if it's only just as, like, a backup or a low-end starter. Uh, and I could see that with Zagadulin. A Wolf, he's interesting, still early with him. And we'll talk about this later as we get through camp or before the season, but I think if Zaga Doolin, I, I agree with you, I think he could be a surprise, and I think the Flames are going to have one too many goaltenders. So we'll talk later about what to do with that. Yeah. Um, I thought Phillips, uh, Dubé, um, Peltier, and uh, Pospisil were really good for the The guys team. you expected to look good. Yeah. I, li- I liked uh, Pospisil's unhingedness in the games. Like, he, you know, he's a very physical player, and I mm-hmm. think that if he can figure out how to control himself and at the AHL level and direct his rage properly, that he could be a very good depth player for the team. Yeah. Especially with his height. And, but still a kid who needs some seasoning. Oh, definitely. Like, he's very unhinged right at the moment, and, like, he's a little over the edge, and he needs to find how to play on that edge where he's not harming the team by taking dumb penalties. But there's enough in the rest of his game where if he can do that and become serviceable defensively, like, he could be a very good, like, Garnett Hathaway-ish, you know, physical banger-type fourth-line guy who can play effectively and get under the other team's skin. Yeah, I can see that maybe in a couple years. Yeah. Well, with main camp now open, it's interesting because last year we saw the Flames bring in a lot of PTOs, more than usual, but that's because they had a split squad. Half their guys were over in China, and they just need bodies over here. And we generally don't see them bring in a lot of what I would kind of call NHL veterans for PTOs. Usually this team likes their college walk-ons, their unsigned WHL guys. Some interesting names at camp this year. Andrew McDonald on defense, Tobias Reeder as a forward, Devontae smith Pelly as a forward. Those are the three that stand out to me. Um, I don't know about you, Matt. I don't think that with Smith or with Stone as the signed here, I don't think McDonald will probably play as a flame much, but I could see either Reeder or smith Pelly becoming our 13th forward. Yeah, uh, and Reeder had the second best fitness testing, I do oh, believe. Oh, yeah, for... that was surprising. And... You know, like when the Edmonton Oilers blame you specifically for missing the playoffs and that the entire reason why they suck is you, not the fact that their team is garbage and their management is incompetent, um, that would tend to piss you off just Mm -hmm. a little bit and motivate you and then you go and sign with their main rival. I would not be shocked if Tobias Reeder ended up making the team and thoroughly enjoyed destroying the Edmonton Oilers when we play them. Let's find would, out what the, what the day of his hat trick this season is going to be then. When's the first time we play the Oilers? Yeah, like, uh, you know, I know myself, if I was in that position, I would be so pissed. <laughs> the 20th of this month, he can light them up in Edmonton in a preseason game. You know, like, even if I wasn't a physical player, I'd be throwing hits left, right, and center just to, like, you know, like head hunting just because screw you guys. <laughs> entirely. This is weird. It, I'm know, just looking like, through the regular season schedule to answer this question. Remember a couple of years ago, we blew like half our Oilers games in the first week of the season. Yeah. It looks like this year we don't play them till December. Weird. 
Yeah, the first game when Raider could light them up is in their barn on the 27th of December, right after well, Christmas. Merry they Christmas, could... yeah. <laughs> and, and then our next game against them is January 11th and January 29th. So, yeah, I can, I mean, I don't want to bring Dubé up, and I think Dubé will be on this team, but I don't want him being the 13th guy. He needs to play at yeah. his age. Yeah, I. Th- he needs to be either first line in Stockton or on the second or third line in Calgary. Like it, he, he needs to play. He needs to play. Yep. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, if we look at the stats of Tobias reader, even though the Oilers said he was the reason that they didn't do anything last year, he still got 11 points, which, you know, is, is it, not it, bad for where he was. Yeah. And it's Edmonton and they're terrible. And you have to like, when I always look at Edmonton free agents after they are done there, I always look at where they were before and just to get a better idea of what they are as a player. Cause there's just something in the water in Edmonton that tends to screw the players up. Cause like every player, it seems that leaves Edmonton plays better as soon as they're out the door. Like look at Taylor Hall. He won the heart trophy. Like, come on, you know, like, yeah. Well, and, it's and, a, and I think that's something yeah. that Reader has going for him is, you know, in his first couple of years, he had 21, 37, 34, 25 points with, and his 37 and 34 with Arizona, which wasn't a great team at the time. So I'm yeah. not saying Reader's going to come in and make an impact. I don't even think he'll be in the starting lineup, but I would be surprised if he wasn't the next um, uh, Freddie Hamilton. Sort of that 13th forward drifts around. We play him when we need to, but a very competent thir- th- number 13. Yeah, I wouldn't even be shocked if he made the team outright. The uh, you know if he's motivated, and if he's going to make the team though, it's at Dubé's expense. That's the only yeah. downside. Yeah, and like that's really or Mangiapane. Yeah, or Mangiapane spot. One of the well, other. Well, you know, honestly, if I were the Flames, if Mangiapane resigns, I'd almost start him in Stockton. I hate to say it, but almost as a punishment. Yeah, like you weren't here. You think you're better than us? You're going to go to Stockton for a little bit. Yeah. You know, so I, I don't think, but yeah, I mean, I think there's one, to me, there's one forward spot available in the top four lines, and it's either going to be Mangiapane, Dubé, or Reader. Yeah. Um, if it's Reader, I wouldn't be surprised if Smith Pelly becomes the 13th forward then. Yeah. Um, if Smith Pelly, when, after he had his uh, very good postseason with Washington, he didn't really. Uh, trained properly last year and came into camp out of shape and you know it, that's why he got banished to the AHL and all that and sucked basically you last know, I year could, I could totally see him being one of the top forwards in Stockton though yeah which if he he's one of those players if he's motivated he's good it's just that you know getting that burr under the saddle is the hard thing to do and if smith if Kelly he's motiv- good in training camp i think he'll get signed by some nhl team yeah like it, he'd be a decent like replacement for garnett hathaway if he's playing like himself when he can play like himself it's yeah. just you know if and maybe basically yeah, so, I mean, interesting names to see there. Um, Tobias Reeder is one I want to watch, and especially the, the fact that he comes into the, flame, into the camp as the most fit flame with the only guy beating him being Giordano. So it was Giordano 1 and Tobias Reeder 2, and I think that says a lot about you know Tobias wanting to make this team. Yeah. Plus, we finally get a good Flames hockey name again if we get Tobias Reeder on this team. Yeah, and I think that because of the fact that... Um, Reader was so trashed by the Oilers that he's going to be extremely motivated, especially coming to Calgary. Like, where better to go to, like, really? If he shove makes it, it, though, it's funny how many guys move from Edmonton to Calgary in the off season. Yeah, I know. Well, that's the thing. Because of the fact that so many Oilers players, once they leave Edmonton, bounce back to what they were. Like it. It's actually a brilliant strategy by Treliving to go after at as many of the guys that they have, because if you're getting Lucic at like what he was, or Talbot what he was, or Reader what he was, like those are fairly good players, and you got them for virtually nothing. So you know, like that that's a very good cheap way to get good players if those guys bounce back. What would you be willing to pay Reader? 
uh, probably one. Uh, I don't see it. I I don't see him getting more than one. No, I I can't either. If we're paying Zarnik just over that, I can't see Reader getting more than one. Yeah. You know how the players love to do these like promotions where if they score a point, they give money to a charity. I want to see Tobias Reader and the Calgary Library do something together. Yeah. Readers, readers. Yeah. For for every time Tobias gets a point, we buy a new book for kids or something like that. I just think that would be a, a great promo. Yeah. Have Reader do a deal with the, di- with well, the library. Well, you see, the thing is, is that one of the reasons why I like the idea of Reader making the team is it, on special teams, if you put Reader and Jankowski together... Uh, we may end up scoring more than we give up shorthanded because <laughs> mm-hmm. Reader is one of the better penalty killers and he scores most of his points shorthanded, like yeah, a good, he... good number of goals. Anyway, when he was with Arizona, I remember him scoring quite a few goals shorthanded. I, I don't want to say it cause I like the kid, but when I was saying earlier, there's probably one spot I could see Reader take Janko's spot and the flames move Janko if Reader's good enough. Yeah, that's possible. You know, because you could even fill that extra center spot with a Dubé or something like that. But I think if Janko doesn't improve, he there's enough talent in this camp that he could be forced out. Yeah. It's one of those things. Darn, we're too good. Jeez. Well, we, we've talked <laughs> about this in the past, right? I mean, a good place to be in, but it really, I think it's got to motivate everybody. To say, you know, there's yeah. enough guys, especially in the bottom six, there's enough guys that if you're not working hard, someone will take your job. Yeah, exactly. Well, Matt, I think that about gets us up to date. Anything else Flames-wise we haven't talked about? No, I'm just looking forward to seeing how camp unfurls and um, curious about the Kachuk situation. I think that'll make a huge impact on the, the team's standings at the end of the year. If he's ready to go for game one, I think everything's fine and... The Flames will probably be around 110 points, and if not, significantly less, but we'll see. Well, by the time this hits uh, everyone's ear holes, the Flames will have played two games. They'll play a split squad game against Vancouver, one side in Penticton and one side in Calgary, or sorry, in Victoria and Calgary. Um, I don't even want to predict those games because I don't even know what the lineups are going to look like. But after that, the rest of the preseason schedule is the 18th. We're here against San Jose. The 20th, we flip, we fly up to Edmonton, take on the Oilers. Hopefully, Reader will be on the first line there. Yep. Uh, the, the 22nd, Winnipeg, we're there. And then Winnipeg comes here on the 24th. 26th, we're in San Jose. And the 28th, Edmonton is here. So that's our preseason schedule. Um, I mean, really, preseason doesn't matter all that much, but... I don't think we see as many rookies in the lineup this year because they're not really playing for anything. But I think you're going to see guys like Lucic, guys like Janko, guys like Reader, who the team's putting them out there to see if they can do better than what we've seen from them. Would you agree? Yeah. And I think that for like the first handful of games, you'll see more of the guys that have things to prove being pushed higher in the lineup just to... Well, Here's your opportunity. Let's see what you got. I honestly, and uh, thinking about just that point, I would not be surprised to see John Gillies start two or three of these games. The f- team can see what they've got in him. Because I think between him, Zagadulin, and um, Parsons, somebody's going to have to go. Yeah. Honestly, I think that Zag will probably be in stock, uh, Kansas. Really? That's where our ECHL team yep. probably just start uh, just because I think they're going to want to give Gillies and Parsons everything in Stockton for a while. And they'll probably, like, if Gillies is not, you know, elevating his game, then I think they'll swap Gillies for Zag halfway through. See, and the only reason I think you might be wrong is after what we saw from Schneider last year, I think you might want to give Schneider a lot of minutes in ECHL. I'm betting, but um, and we'll see as the camp goes on. But I think you'll see Gillies moved with somebody like Froelich. I think it'll yeah, be Froelich and Gillies be to yeah. Anaheim or something like that. Everyone needs goalies. Yeah, or even just here's for future considerations like uh, the Thomas McCollum trade a couple years ago. Yeah, McCollum's nowhere near the goalie that Gillies. No, is, I know, so, but, but yeah, like if Gillies doesn't like show up yeah. now, but like I mean, it's... you could probably get a fourth for Gillies. We're missing our fourth this year. Yeah, I because he's on a one-way deal this year. I don't see getting virtually anything for him, unfortunately. Just you know, people we, we've are been reticent to... from Edmonton. Maybe we can send Gillies up there, and then it's more fair. Yeah, 
We'll see. Yep. Um, well, Matt, I uh, I guess that's it for this week. We will talk to you next week, and um, and yeah, enjoy the first part of the training camp. Uh, get well soon, Beasley. I know you had your fun injury where you broke all your ribs during. I can Zampede tell you, and... I was with him yesterday. His cast is off, so he's pretty much fully healed. Uh, that's excellent news to hear, and hopefully he's a hundred percent because you never like to see anybody go through anything like that like just horrific injury and when he and i were talking he said i'm just fine to sit in a chair and yell into a microphone so he'll be ready to go good news to hear and i'm glad i've been worried about him all because i haven't asked you about him and yeah glad to hear yeah i see bees all the time and he's good to go he's excited for the season so uh friend of the show and no doubt we'll be ready to hear his usual growl of are you ready in just a few short weeks when the flames open up here at home all right matt well i think that's it for us uh we want to remind fans if you want if you have any anything you want to tell us about or have your own feedback let us know get a hold of us now the season start again we'd love to share your thoughts talk about what you guys want to talk about uh the best way on twitter is tweet us at fireside podcast on facebook or facebook.com slash fireside chat let us know what you think of what's going on let us know who you think might make this team or not make this team and uh maybe matt and i will share some of your thoughts on the show next week as always thanks for listening and go flames go Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.